1961 saw the publication of a novel which was entitled Two Men in the West. Its author, Bal Chandra Rajan, has often been accused of having spent most of his life abroad. But here he is with us in India in the studio today and it's a great pleasure to have him with us. Professor Rajan was born in Burma in 1920 and at the age of six or seven he moved to India or rather he moved from what was then a distant part of India to another part of our country and he pursued his education later at Presidency College Madras. From there he moved on to Cambridge and in 1947 he published his first book, Paradise Lost and the Seventeenth Century Reader. This was his doctoral dissertation submitted to Cambridge University. This established him as one of the most outstanding Indian scholars in the field of English literary studies and he followed this work by editing a collection of essays on T.S. Eliot, a study by various hands which uh, circulated very widely and thereafter he joined the Indian Foreign Service. He was in fact one of the select band of six who were handpicked when the service, the Indian Foreign Service, was started soon after independence. He had a distinguished career as a diplomat, but in 1961 he decided to return to academia. He joined the University of Delhi as its second professor of English, and he was, he was also to serve as the dean of the arts faculty of that university. In 1964, he proceeded as visiting professor to the University of Wisconsin, and two years later, he joined the English department uh, as a senior professor at the University of Western Ontario in London, Canada. He published a book on W.B. Yeats in 65, followed by books on Milton, The Lofty Rhyme, and on T.S. Eliot, The Overwhelming Question. Some years ago, in 1985, he brought out The Form of the Unfinished, a study of the poetics of fragmentary works from Spencer to Ezra Pound. He broke new ground with that work. For some years now, Professor Rajan has been working on a study of which he proposes to publish in book form. The working title he has in mind is Appropriating India, Discourse and Dominance from Milton to Macaulay. Professor Rajan, uh, we have thought of you as a literary critic more or less in the classic mold. Our century has seen the rise of new criticism and literary criticism has tended at least in the first half of the century to have a rather special focus. It has tended to focus on literature itself. And with your books on Milton, on Yeats, on T.S. Eliot, we have thought of you in that mold. Now you have turned to a work that seems to break new ground and touches on many disciplines. How did you get to turn in this, in such a direction? Let me begin by saying that uh, throughout my work, I think I have been text attentive. The uh, earliest work I did was on a specific poem. The three books that I wrote subsequently were on the overall work of individual authors attempting to show the relationship which uh, one work within the other 
they to another. The form we are finished can be defined as a uh, general study in which uh, I endeavor to study the unfinished form as a form, but not simply as a form in a genre, but as a dismantling force within the English canon. The book I am now writing could also be considered a genre study if we are prepared to regard imperialism as a cultural genre. And one could then say that uh, I'm endeavoring to study not simply the articulated force in imperialism as a genre, but the dismantling force within the genre, much as I did in the form of the unfinished. So I think that there is a continuity between the various things I've done or are attempting to do. I think, however, that text attentiveness can inexorably lead to quite different consequences. But whereas in the work I have done so far, text attentiveness has had strictly literary consequences, in the work I'm doing now, text attentiveness has social and cultural consequences. In a sense, uh, paradise lost on the 17th century reader was put in Milton in the context of his century and the intellectual traditions of that century. And uh, I think your present work helps one to see that even at that point when you wrote on Milton, you were trying to see the literary classic, as it were, in the context of a tradition of ideas that were much wider than merely literary ideas. Would you like to uh, sh uh, you know, share uh, the scope of your, uh, the work that you have in hand? You start with Milton and you end with Macaulay. Yes, it is described in the uh, tentative title as uh, Discourse and Dominance from Milton to Macaulay. But uh, it actually starts with uh, a Portuguese writer, Camus, the author of the Lusiades. The Lusiades is a poem that provides an epic celebration of uh, Vasco da Gama's discovery of India. And uh, it is therefore a poem of uh, special pertinence to the Western representation of India. That poem was written in uh, 1580 or thereabouts, was translated by Fanshawe into English. But the Fanshawe translation was not actually published until 1655. And that place is going in uh, quite interesting proximity to Paradise Lost, which is published 12 years later. Uh, the relationship between Milton and Camus when it comes to uh, the uh, understanding of the idea of empire and the way in which the idea, the idea of empire is treated is, uh, I think, uh, quite rewarding to consider. And the further reason for my choosing means as uh, the uh, opening chapter of a prospective book is that uh, the discovery of India when the arrival of India, which takes place in the seventh canto of uh, the Lusiads, is uh, ornamented by a very significant metaphor in which India seems to be perceived as a gateway. And in that gateway we find uh, sculptured uh, the figures of the uh, previous conquerors of India. So, the clear implication is that uh, India is a country opening itself to conquest. It is a gateway through which the people, as it were, offers itself for subjection. I think that this is a, a remarkable subtext 
which uh, enters very deeply into the, the Western understanding of India. And of course the subtext, which immediately legitimizes the concept of dominance, and therefore the association of discourse with dominance can be said to begin with that work. And uh, I then endeavor uh, to trace it in uh, subsequent records. We tend to think of Milton as, uh, you know, in, in his uh, epic Paradise Lost and its uh, the other one, Paradise Regained, as dealing with the matter that is biblical in character. Uh, he has some references to India. One remembers some of his similes from Paradise Lost. How extensive is his contribution to the kind of discourse that you are studying in your book? Uh, we can have at some length as to whether Milton uh, was uh, an imperialist poet. And uh, I am, in fact, in the process of editing a collection of essays uh, tentatively titled uh, Milton and the Imperial Vision, which will take up various aspects of this question. If we look at his specific references to India, there aren't that many of them. But I don't think that his place in the formation of imperial discourse can be reduced to a matter of five or six similes which see India in more than one light. Yeah. Milton is taken into imperial discourse in a variety of ways. For example, the uh, creation in the seventh book of Paradise Lost is an imperial act that is the imposition of order upon a chaos which is in itself incapable of order. And you will find this justifying proposition used more than once in imperial discourse to just to, uh, to validate and legitimize the view of an external power over India. Uh, many books tend to take up the language of the creation, the Miltonic creation in the seventh book, uh, not necessarily in a conscious way, but in a subliminal way, if uh, you choose to put it like that. One can also say that uh, the relationship between Adam and Eve can be used as a metaphor for the marriage of uh, East and West. And it is in fact used as a metaphor for the marriage of East and West in uh, a quite remarkable novel called The Missionary by Sidney Olson, who uses the, the, the marriage of Adam and Eve in the first place to uh, set up a model for East West relationships, and then continues our narration in uh, such a way as uh, to bring into question, interrogate, and eventually possibly undermine the uh, nature of that relationship. And you can also see the concept of uh, Christian heroism in Paradise Lost, which replaces Homeric heroism with the better fortitude of patience and heroic martyrdom, leading on to Prometheus Unbound, and leading on from there to the uh, nonviolent tactics, patience and fortitude, which eventually gained India for independence. Uh, therefore, I think the participation and the appropriation of Milton by uh, imperial discourse is uh, not a simple one sided of matter, but that he is very much there as a presence in the making of that discourse is uh, not, I think, a matter which you can dispute. You do have to handle it, I think, with uh, certainty intact, but uh, you do have to acknowledge it's quite a considerable presence. That's, uh, that is fascinating in the sense that when you come to the 20th century, you find that on the one hand, 
the civil servants and uh, the viceroy and uh, the whole what you call the British Bandavast in India for the Raj carrying on the business of government. And simultaneously you have people like C.F. Andrews who are engaged in a counter discourse. So in a sense, Milton as it were, coming at the very point at which England's imperial history was about to commence, anticipates both developments, or at least one can relate subsequent developments back to Milton. Yes, indeed, I think he's at the roots of both the articulation and the dismantling, and uh, that's the reason why his uh, presence in the book, as it were, is uh, quite important. Of course, I'm a Miltonist, and I find it very difficult to get away from Milton. But uh, I would like to feel that uh, when I bring him in, uh, it is not the reason. Milton, in a sense, as far as uh, discourse and dominance vis-à-vis -vis England are concerned, starts off your discussion. What would be the other major uh, phases in the development you trace? The next chapter is on Jordan. It's on a specific play, Bonzi. But there happens to be I think uh, the first work, or at least the first work of consequence, which takes uh, India as its subject. It is actually written about a contemporary monarch, while he was on the throne of India at that time. It is addressed to another contemporary monarch. Charles II, who took an important part, or a significant part at any rate, in the affairs of the East India Company. He actually leased Bombay to the East India Company. Bombay came to him as part of the diary of Catherine of Raganza. Uh, so uh, that play is involved in uh, an interesting social context. And uh, in taking up Aronzi as uh, an example for British royalty to emulate, it completely inverts the character of the historical Aronzi. And the inversion is so systematic that it simply cannot be called accidental. It is as if the play were trying to demonstrate that India is the utterly other, and that if you're going to English or assimilate into Englishness the utterly other, uh, you have to turn totally upside down everything that you discover in the other. Uh, I find it a highly interesting play uh, for that reason. Uh -huh. I think it is uh, witty, elegantly conceived. It uh, is fortunately devoid of the kind of abusiveness which characterizes later English rhetoric about India. And therefore you could say it's uh, an enlightening and not unpleasant read. You said that there's uh, a kind of uh, negative uh, element in the rhetoric about India that characterized English discourse. But uh, isn't there a phase in the 18th century in particular when there is a tantalizing moment when you feel that the, the English were trying to understand the Indian tradition, the phrase you have done associates with names like William Jones. That is what you might call uh, a rather narrow window of opportunity. I think the trial of uh, 
Railway really stones uh, brings to a head uh, the British misgivings about the nature of their Indian enterprise. But uh, the highly theatrical staging of that trial, its uh, terror duration, tended to uh, exercise a cathartic effect upon uh, the English public. So that having gone through this cleansing, as it were, uh, they seem to forget the reality of the problem. The transference of responsibility for the uh, ethics of management of India from the East India Company to the British Parliament did not necessarily mean that the uh, moralities of governing India were thereafter to be subjected to uh, a radical change and to a fundamental humanization. Uh, you could argue, in fact, that uh, the course of history suggests that the uh, direction of things was quite otherwise. During the period which uh, the impeachment of Adam Hastings uh, figures in, the Royal Asia, the Asiatic Society was founded. And the work of William James can be regarded as sympathetic to India in a way in which evangelical missionary discourse was distinctly not. James was able to uh, establishing the Indian civilization, Indian classical civilization more specifically, as a civilization not only of some consequence, but as a sister civilization of Greece and Rome. You can find the works of that period, notably uh, Elizabeth Hamilton's Letters of the Hindu Raja as uh, arguing for the reinstatement of Hindu culture as considering it as the sort of thing which a humane dominant power such as the British might be expected to do. India was to be restored to her true self in uh, the uh, more optimistic versions of this scenario. But uh, if you examine the scenario, you will see that it is highly inconvenient to imperial ambitions and practices. You cannot give a subject nation parity with yourself. You cannot enter into a dialogic relationship with the culture of a conquered people because the very nature of dialogue would undermine the dominance on which we were, on which imperialism has to be based. So in the end, we have to find the rhetoric and the proposition and even the ideology for the devaluation of the subject people as meriting their own subjection. And that is what happens 
in the subsequent phase of the exercise of British power over India, the window of opportunity, as I have chosen to call it, is not a very wide window. The possibilities for intercultural understanding that could have been built on the work of William Jones and his colleagues was closed out. They were, they were closed out because they had to be closed out in the nature of imperialism itself.